Hello everyone and welcome to Meet Me at the Table. This is Colin and today we are going to start a playthrough of Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage board game. This is from the Dungeons and Dragons adventure board game set. I think this is the most recent one that's come out that's that fully cooperative. You're going through a dungeon, leveling yourself up. What's really fun about this one though is it is a campaign. All the other ones are one-offs. Uh, I think Temple of Elemental Evil, or one of the other ones, you had something that you could do, but this one has the most robust leveling system, which is why I kept this one. I actually sold all the other ones. I just have this one. The only bad part about this game is it's riddled with errata, so I have printed the errata sheet. Hopefully, <laughs> I won't miss anything, but if I do, uh, I'm sorry if I miss an errata. We're just having fun here, so we'll just keep on rolling. Now, I've realized I've been playing a ton of card games on the channel recently, so I thought it'd be really fun to do some dungeon delvers, and this one is no exception. This game is deceptively simple, but a lot of times can really smash you in the face. So, really excited to show this to you. We're going to do Adventure 1. I'm hoping to do at least a few of these. I can show you how you level up. And if you have this sitting on your shelf, I'd recommend pulling it out and you can play along. Don't forget to turn on those Klingon subtitles. If I do make any errors and miss them in editing, you can see those errors as Klingon subtitles when they pop up. All right, let's do a quick setup and then we'll just jump in to Adventure 1. Before you start your campaign, you'll need to choose your heroes you're going to play with. I'm going to play with three because I really enjoy the variety and it's not challenging to control multiple heroes in this game. So I'm going to use Marcone, Atka, and Cormac. To set up your hero, you'll want to grab their hero board and make sure it's set at the first level. We don't want the second level. Well, we do want the second level, but we have to level up to do that. Uh, there is an errata right off the get-go on Marcone. He has an AC, which means he can get hit for damage if the enemies roll a 16 or higher. That's actually supposed to be a 14. Yeah, isn't that terrible? Oh, uh, he looked totally amazing at 16. He's still going to be good, but we have to remember that that AC is 14, not 16. If ever you're defeated in the game, we do have one healing surge. We can bring one character back. They come back at the surge value of health, which is three. But if ever two of our heroes are defeated, that's how we lose the scenario. He has a speed of six. We so can move a ton, six different squares on his turn. He has a special ability, Tempestuous Magic. You may move up to two spaces before or after each attack action you take, which is really nice. At the bottom of the hero board, we can see the different powers that we can use with Marcone. He has the Font of Magic, and then he can choose one of his at-will powers, two of his utility powers, and one of his daily powers. Utility and daily powers, after you use them, you generally flip them face down, can't use them again. The at-will ones will generally stay face up. Think of that like your cantrip uh, spells or your basic attacks, you'll always have that available to you. I chose Thunderclap for my at-will power, but I also get Font of Magic. This one states, use when you flip one of your daily or utility powers face down. Place a Font of Magic token on this card instead of flipping the power. If there are already three Font of Magic tokens on this card, you may not use this ability. So that allows us to use our abilities more than just one time, which is really cool. I then have my two utility powers and my daily power. So this utility power, which is control wins, it's a uh, passive, so I don't actually have to activate it to use it. It says attacks against you from monsters that are at least one tile away from your hero are made as though the monster had disadvantage. That means he rolls two dice, takes the lower number. We have Heart of the Storm. Each time you use a daily power, deal one damage to each adjacent monster. That's great because this is my daily power, and I can use this three times. Actually, I think I can use it four times in total in the game. I can place three fonts of magic on my font of magic card, and then I'd have to flip this over. So that's four times a game. Attack one, two, or three monsters. Each monster must be within one tile of your hero. We roll our die, and then we modify that roll by plus seven. We deal two damage. Even if we miss, we still deal one damage. Although Marcone doesn't have a ton of health, those abilities can be amazing to help us. So love that we're playing with him. Our fighter here is Atka. Atka, 
she is hard to hit. You have to roll a 17 or higher to hit her. She has 10 health. Her movement speed is 5. And then if she does have to use a healing surge, she comes back with 5 health. She has Rallying Cry. When you regain HP or send a healing surge, spend a healing surge, all other heroes on your tile regain 1 HP and gain advantage. Advantage means you roll 2 dice and you take the better number, which is nice. She can use the Hellish Rebuke, 1 at will power, 2 uh, utility powers, and 1 daily power. The at will power I've chosen for Atka is Sword and Shield. She's going to be our tank. Attack 1 adjacent monster. Hit or miss, encounters deal 1 less damage to you until the start of your next turn. We get to roll plus 8 when we roll our add, plus 8 when we roll our dice, and deal 1 damage. She has her renowned adventure. Use at the start of the adventure. Draw one treasure card. If it's not an item, we just keep discarding until we draw an item. We'll put it on here and we can use it during the game. If at the end of the adventure you still have it, you'll just discard it. We have our lucky charm. If we roll a one, we just get to re-roll it. I love that one. And then her daily power is attack one adjacent monster, then attack one adjacent monster. Adds plus uh, eight to the die roll. Two damage if you hit, one damage even if you miss. The item Atka found was a potion of healing. Used during your hero phase, your hero or a hero adjacent to your hero regains two hit points, and you discard it after playing. Finally, we have Cormac. Cormac is our half-elf cleric. He has AC of 16, uh, only 8 health, movement of 5, and if he dies and comes back, he comes back with 4 health. He has Circle of Mortality. When you or another hero within one tile of you is reduced to exactly 0 HP, roll a die. On an 11 or higher, that hero is reduced to 1 HP instead, so he can help us survive just a little bit longer if we need. Can you tell I'm getting ready to be knocked around? These three characters are going to be fun. Okay, we have for our powers the Blessed Stakes, uh, 1 at will, 2 utility, and 1 daily. I grabbed the Righteous Throw at will. You can just attack one monster on your tile, so he can attack range, but it has to be within his tile. Uh, only adds three to the roll, but that deals two damage. That's why I wanted that one. This one, attack one adjacent monster. This attack deals plus one damage against undead. So if we find any undead, we are so good against them. We have our Bane. Use during your hero phase. Choose up to three monsters within one tile of your hero. Each of those monsters gain disadvantage. We also have Speak with Dead. Discard one monster card from your experience pile to do one of the following. Cancel an encounter card you just drew or reveal all traps on your hero tile. And then finally, Potent Energies. Each time you roll an 18 or higher on one of Cormac's attacks, the attack deals plus one damage. This is in addition to any extra damage for a critical hit. In general, a critical hit is rolling a natural 20. Some abilities let you affect that, but right now we only can get a critical hit if we roll a 20. The last part of our hero setup is grabbing a healing surge. One character can go down and we won't lose the game. If a second character goes down and it's their turn, so when they uh, activate the next time and they have zero health, then you lose the game. Now we can set up all the cards. There's lots of cards in this game. There's monster cards, there's encounter cards, and treasure cards. What's important to note is if you're playing the campaign, which is what we're doing, you only want to grab cards between 1 and 184. All the other cards are going to be ones that slide in during the campaign. So I've made sure to only include the non-upgraded monsters, encounters, and treasure cards. Same thing with spell cards. We'll set them off to the side. We also have trap cards. And then finally, we have these Elder Rune cards, and certain cards might require us to flip those. For an example, a trap card, if a trap token has the uh, keyword draw on it, we will draw the top card of this trap deck, and it's terrible. Sometimes we get to cast spells, so we'll draw this. And sometimes we need to look at an Elder Rune. These Elder Rune cards, half of it's good, half of it's bad on the top or bottom of the card. And the card that tells you to draw that will tell you which side of that card to draw. With all of that set up out of the way, let's start Adventure 1, Mopping Up. Following the mysterious pole that has led you here, you have arrived at the infamous tavern that serves as the entrance to the Undermountain, the Yawning Portal. Asking around, you hear that the barkeep, Durnan, is offering a reward for anyone who will clear out a bandit gang known as the Undertakers, who have taken up residence in the dungeon. Recently, they dared to rob several of his patrons, and now he wants them gone. Our objective here is simple, just defeat four humans. We need to find four humans in the monster deck, defeat them, and we win. 
Our tile set is the dungeon tiles set. Now, unfortunately, the game doesn't tell you what the dungeon tile set looks like versus the cave tile setup, uh, but you can kind of tell from the art. The FAQ tells you there's 23, I believe, dungeon tiles and 17 cavern. So I have the 23 dungeon tiles. And I will put a link in the description below for the FAQ. So if you're playing, you make sure you download that and have it. <laughs> Our special components in this adventure is the entry well tile. Then we'll just simply shuffle the rest of the dungeon tile stack. Now we do have a special rule for this one. We can track the bandits. This adventure features a new action that a hero can take. When a hero takes the track bandits action, he or she may spend five experience points to track the bandits. You cannot use human monsters in your experience pile for this action, nor can you use them to cancel encounter cards. When the experience is spent, draw cards from the monster deck until a human monster monster is drawn, place that monster figure onto the ambush symbol nearest to the hero that tracked the bandit. The card goes to the hero as normal as uh, um, they'll control them. You'll see how that works as we play them. Afterwards, shuffle the other cards you drew back into the monster deck. When there are four humans in the experience pile, we'll read this second section. Now, I just want to show you this page as well, because we can see the yawning portal is for adventures one to four, okay? And you can see on the right-hand side, there's canceling encounters. We can spend five XP for these first four adventures to cancel one of the encounter cards, because a lot of them are horrible. <laughs> and that's the way we can prevent them from being terrible. We also can use 2,000 gold pieces to level up to level two, but we can't go past level two. All experience is shared by the players. However, the gold is supposed to be individual. However, you can share them during the town phase. So I'll keep the gold separate during the scenario. But then when we go to the town phase to potentially level up or buy items or whatnot, I will pull all the coins together because it doesn't matter at that point. The final piece we need to walk through before starting our gameplay is how the sequence of a turn works. So we start with a hero phase, then an exploration phase, then a uh, villain phase. I am planning on having Cormac go first, followed by Atka, followed by Marcone. Okay, so that's the order of our heroes. And we're just going to keep going in that order, starting with the hero phase, exploration phase, villain phase. During the hero phase, we're going to walk through these steps. So first, if you have zero hit points, use a healing surge token. And uh, if you can't, then you lose the game. Number two, move and perform one of the following actions. Now, it doesn't say it on this card, but you can move before or after doing these actions. So you can move, attack, disable a trap, or other if there's something else that is an action. Now, some of the utility uh, abilities that we have aren't actual actions. They'll state either that they're an action, or if it's an attack, well, then it's an attack, and that means that's what you have to do. Um, that's your one action for the turn. After you complete that, then you'll flip this over. We go to the exploration phase. If we occupy a square that's adjacent to an unexplored edge, we'll go to step two. Otherwise, we'll skip to the villain phase. If we are at the edge of a map, then we'll draw a dungeon tile and place it with its triangle adjacent to the unexplored edge. Then we have to draw monster cards and place any new trap tokens on that tile, if need be. After that, we would go to the villain step. We first check to see if we had revealed a dungeon tile. If we hadn't revealed a dungeon tile, we have to draw an encounter card and those are brutal. Or even if we've revealed a dungeon tile, but it has a black arrow, we're going to have an encounter anyways. Yay. <laughs> then if there's a villain in play, it will activate and that activates every player's turn. Finally, we'll activate each monster you control in turn order that you drew them. And then that's the end of your turn. So let's start with Cormac. Cormac has a very easy turn. He's not going to move. He's not going to do an action. There's nothing he can do here. He's already at an edge. So we're actually just going to essentially skip our first hero phase. It's generally how it works in that first round. What we'll do is move right to the exploration phase. We are at an edge of a tile and there is an unexplored location. So that means we will draw our first dungeon tile. We'll flip it over. Oh, it has a white arrow. What that means is we don't have to worry about drawing an encounter. Now we have to place this like so. We can see on this tile there's two different icons. This icon means a monster is going to spawn in this location. This is an ambush token, which inherently doesn't do anything, or I should say ambush symbol. It doesn't do anything, but if ever there was a special effect and it says on this tile we do that effect, generally speaking, we, this is where that effect would occur. So this helps us know, okay, where is this effect happening or whatnot. Uh, so we need to draw one monster from the monster card stack. We found ourselves a thug. Now this thug is human, so that can be one of the four we need to defeat for this scenario. 
This is how the thug will activate. It has an AC, so we need to roll a 12 with our modifications, a 12 or higher to hit it. It only has one health. When it attacks us, it will roll a d20 and then add six, and it will deal one damage and then disadvantage whoever it hits. Uh, I do have that deluxe version, so all of these were pre-painted, so they're not the best painted, but hey, they're not gray, I'll take it. As Cormac peers down the hallway, he finds a thug. The thug will be placed in that location. That will end the exploration phase, and this thug will now activate at the end of every uh, turn that Cormac has because he's the one who's controlling that monster. Finally, we do move to the villain phase. We did explore, and we did not have a black triangle. We had a white one, so no encounter. There's no villain for this entire scenario, so we can ignore that. Now the monster, the thug, that we just revealed will activate. The thug is pretty basic. If the thug is within one tile of a hero, yes, it's in within one tile, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and attacks that hero with its mace. Otherwise, it would move one tile towards the closest hero. So he's going to move in and attack. Both monsters and heroes can attack diagonally, and whenever there's a choice of what an enemy is going to attack, we get to choose as long as they are both within the same distance. So the thug was here, one, two, it can attack either Cormac, and yes, this is Cormac, which doesn't really look like the picture, but that's okay. This is Cormac. This one, Atka, does look pretty good. Uh, but we can either have him attack Atka or Cormac. We're definitely going to have him attack Atka because her uh, defense, or I should say AC, is 17. So that means he has to roll an 11 or higher to hit her. We'll give our die a roll, and he rolled a 10. 10 plus 6 is 16. Not enough to damage Atka. All right, now it's Atka's turn. Atka is adjacent to that thug. We need to take him out. Let's use our sword and shield. Remember, after we use this, no matter what until our next turn, all of the different enemies that attack us, it'll deal us one less damage, which is awesome. So we're rolling. We need, or we get to add eight to our roll. That means we only need a four or higher to hit him. And we have a 10. 10 plus eight is 18. That will deal one damage to the thug and defeat the thug. So we now place this into our experience pile. Normally, we can use experience to help us cancel encounter cards, but he is human, so we can't use that. We'll just set it aside. We have one of our four humans that we've defeated. And, of course, I'll remove his miniature from the board. Whenever you defeat an enemy, you also get a free treasure draw. However, that's only once per turn. So if I defeat three enemies in one turn, I still only draw one encounter card. If you've watched any of Paul Darcy's playthroughs, you know how easy it is to forget to draw your treasure card. We'll flip over that top treasure card, and we have a bag of silver. This is a play immediately, and then you discard it. We just gain 200 gold pieces. I have this really cool pirate gold poker set, and I've been trying to figure out what game I could use it for. I'm going to use it for this one. So these are going to be considered 100. Okay, so that's 200. I then have three other types. So I'm going to say that this set is worth 300 gold pieces. This one's worth 500, and this one is worth 1,000. Okay, so right now, we have 200. But yeah, don't you just love the sound? These are real metal. They look awesome. I love how they look. We've done our action for the turn, but we can still move. So I think Atka's going to move one, two. And that allows us to explore over here. So during that exploration phase, we will draw our next dungeon tile. This one also has a white symbol. Oh my gosh, three enemies though. Oh boy. This is where we can get overwhelmed quickly. Let's draw three monster tiles. This is the ambush token, so once again, no uh, traps, which is really nice. If you've played, I can't remember which one it was, but one of them, they had way too many traps and it was just obnoxious because you couldn't do really anything to negate the trap damage, and it would sometimes would kill you, right? So I feel like they have a good variety on these tiles. Our first monster card will be Ghostly Procession. Strange apparitions march out of one wall and into the other in eerie silence, completely ignoring you. Do not place a monster. Oh my gosh, that's that's epic. Our next one, we have the Grung. This guy only has a 13 AC, only one health, and attacks adding five. So that's not terrible. So that's only one monster. And then our next one is the Shadow. Ooh, this one has a 15 AC. It does an attack of six on oh, it weakens one. This is something new. So if it hits, you get weakened, and this can be absolutely brutal. So instead of you taking damage, it actually reduces your total health. So you can never get rid of this except for when you use a healing surge 
or you have something that removes a condition. The frogs are teeny, teeny, tiny. Look at how small they are. The shadows, though, not so much, and they look awesome. They're kind of that different, you know, I don't know, plastic. They look so cool, especially when they are right around your hero. It looks like they're just going to eat you. <laughs> All right, we'll put them there. Unfortunately, during the villain phase, the nice thing is no encounter because it's a white triangle. The bad thing is both of these will activate. We drew the grung first, so the grung will activate first, followed by the shadow. This card states, if the grung is on the same tile as a hero, it attacks the closest hero with its dagger, then moves to the closest tile with no heroes. Oh, it's going to jump all the way over there. Interesting. And these are selections. So if it can do this one, we don't have to do these. And yes, it is this one because it's on the same. Actually, it's not on the same tile, I'm realizing. We are still on another tile. So it says, if grunge is within one tile of a hero, it leaps to attack the closest hero with its dagger, then returns to the starting space, effectively just not moving. So we'll leave it where it is. It's rolling, adding five, trying to hit Atka. The nice thing is, is even if it hits Atka, we won't take damage because of our sword and shield. I am so wrong. This has encounters, not monsters. I was thinking, gosh, that is an insanely powerful card. Uh, no, it's only encounters will do less, one less damage. So no, we can get hit here. He needs to roll a 12 or higher to hit us. Rolled a 19, almost a crit. So we will take one damage for that. Remember, we have 10 health, so we're down to nine. I'll just place this on our board to, denote, to notate that. For our shadow, if the shadow is within one tile of a hero, it moves adjacent to the hero with the lowest AC within one tile of the shadow and attacks that hero with strength drain. Yep, can do that. So adding six, it won't deal a damage to Atka. It'll actually weaken her. Lucky for us, Cormac does have a lower AC, but he's two tiles away. So this shadow is just going to come right up to here adjacent. And I believe I get to pick... So I'll pick here so it's easier for someone else to attack it. And he's going to roll adding 6. So he needs to roll an 11 or higher to hit Atka. We'll roll up that die. And we've got a 3, so that's a miss. Our monk will activate next. He has 6 movement. He's going to move 1, 2, 3, 4. So he can do that. He can move through friendly characters. Of course, he could just move diagonally to 1, 2, 3, 4. He's going to move here because then he's going to attack that shadow. We're going to use our Thunderclap. Attack each monster on your tile. That's only one. If only one monster is on your tile, this attack and this attack hits. That monster is stunned. That doesn't matter if we hit that shadow is dead because it only has one health. We're adding six to this roll, so we just need to roll a nine or higher to hit. We'll roll up our dime. We have a 15. That's certainly enough. The shadow is removed from the board. We have two experience with this one, and those two we can actually use, unlike the human one. And we get to draw a treasure card. We'll draw our treasure, and it is the Eyes of the Eagle. Play this item immediately. While this item is in play, your hero gains plus one bonus to attack rolls against monsters at least one tile away from your hero. Wow, that seems pretty good. Due to our tempestuous magic, we could move two spaces after that attack, but I think I'm going to stay here because I want to continue to explore the dungeon. I don't want to draw an encounter card if I don't have to. So that will end his turn. We'll go ahead and draw our next, next dungeon tile. Three more enemies. Do you see what I mean? Holy moly, we're totally going to get overwhelmed. Three more enemies. No traps, though, here. I'm certainly enjoying not drawing encounter cards, but three monsters. Okay, our first one is a veteran. Hey, that's another human at least. Needs a 14. Rolls uh, adding 7. He has a special ability. When hitting a hero that has a disadvantage, it gains plus 1 damage. Oh, okay, nobody has disadvantage right now. Uh, the second one is a flying sword. Those guys are obnoxious, plus they have 2 health. Needs a 14 or higher to hit. This says the flying sword is immune to all conditions. We can't give him a condition. Adds plus eight, worth two experience. Okay, what's our third one? Our third one is mad <laughs> laughter. The sound of a man's crazed laughter echoes throughout the corridors. Do not place a monster. Okay, so that's nice at least. We'll place that flying sword right here and the veteran right here. Because we do have a white triangle, which is actually insane. I feel like half of these dungeon tiles at least have the black triangle, but we've been getting lucky there. We don't have to draw an encounter card, so I can't show you that yet. But now we're going to activate these, starting with the veteran. Yeah, because we drew the veteran first. If the veteran is within one tile of a hero, yes it is, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and attacks that hero with its long sword. And the special is about being disadvantaged, so it's just adding 7. Remember, our AC is not 16, it's only 14. 
So that means he only has to roll a seven or higher to hit us. Now this might be gaming the system, so you'll have to tell me if this is illegal or not, but I'm gonna put the veteran here. The advantage of doing that is he's on a different tile than we are, but he's still adjacent. However, since he's on a different tile, attacks against you from monsters that are at least one tile away from your hero are made as though the monster has disadvantage. I'm going to go with it. So I'm going to roll two dice. He'll take the worst result. <laughs> uh, this is the only way Marcone's going to survive, really. If I'm wrong, they'll let me know, and I'll make sure to fix that for any future playthroughs. We try and control the winds from that veteran who is attacking us. He gets either a 9 or 11. Well, I think the 9 is still going to hit us. So that's dealing us 1 damage. We only have 5 health remaining. The flying sword will activate next. If the flying sword is within 2 tiles of, here, of a hero, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and attacks with the blade. The blade is a plus 8, dealing 1 damage. I'll place that flying sword right here, and once again, he's one tile away, so I'll say he has disadvantage. Oh, actually, and no, it says as if I'm not giving him the condition disadvantaged. He just attacks us disadvantaged because we're controlling the wind, so I'll give us that too. I could totally be wrong, but I'm okay with that. Okay, we have a five as the lower result, which actually means he misses. Eight plus five is 13. Yes, our AC is 14. Now you'll notice we did not activate the Grung over here because that is controlled by Atka. So only at the end of Atka's turn will the Grung activate. Let's say that Marcone had drawn another Grung card though. That would have spawned a second Grung. And then every time either one of those heroes ended their turn, both of the Grungs activate. So you've got to be careful of that. But it's I, I think it's a really cool system how they do it. Very simple. But I do like you have a little bit of a strategy on which enemies to attack. For an example, it's now Cormac's turn. He currently has no monsters that he is going to activate. If I don't explore a new edge, I could just go and attack this Grung if I can get over there, and then potentially not have to activate any monsters at the end of my turn. However, I do feel like Marcone is the one who needs the most help, so I'm actually thinking of coming over here. And you're going to see there's two monsters here. They're now blocking us. We cannot move through monsters, okay? We can move through heroes, can't end in the space of the hero, but cannot move through monsters. I do think Cormac is going to try and help uh, Marcone. So he's going to move one, two. He's right next to Marcone. And then what he's going to do, I'd love to attack this sword, but my attack, the Righteous Throw, which deals two damage, I have to have the enemy on the same tile. So if this was not on the same tile over here, I can't attack the sword with that ability. See, I'm at least using it for myself too. <laughs> so instead, I think we'll just do our other attack, the Blessed Stakes, and attack this veteran, because that only has one health. We get to add eight to this roll, and we need a total of 14. I only need a 6 or a higher, that's a 12, that will take out the veteran because it only has 1 health, and that's our second human monster actually already, so that's 2 out of the 4 we need for this scenario. This may go pretty quick. No exploration this time because we're not at an unexplored edge, that means during the villain phase we have to draw an encounter card. I would say about 97% of these are bad. A couple of them could be good. Oh, the piercer, that doesn't sound good. What you thought was a stalactite turns out to be a piercer and drops right at your head. Attack your hero, adds 8 to the die roll, and deals us 2 damage. We only have 8 health. We'll roll up our die. We have an 11 plus 8. That's definitely enough. Our AC is 16. So that means we take 2 damage. Ow. Do you see why sometimes it's better to spawn monsters? So we have two damage, Adka has one, and Marcone has one. The only good thing is we don't have to activate any monsters. We don't have any that we're controlling. So we'll move right to Adka's turn, and she's going to move one, two. She's going to try and take out this Grung if we can. We only need a 13. I'm going to use our same ability, the sword and shield. So that means we get to add eight to our roll. Eight plus, and we'll see, we rolled a 10, that's 18, yeah, that Grung is gone, and we get to draw a treasure card, and that is another experience, so we have three experience sitting in our pool that we can use to cancel encounter cards, I need two more before that's useful. We can flip over our treasure card, and we have a pouch of copper, gain 100 gold pieces, she's the only one with money, she now will have one of these 300s, I'll discard the other two, yeah, so she's the richest one of the party. We are at an unexplored edge, so during the exploration phase, uh, we will draw one that has a black triangle. That means we're still going to have an encounter. And we'll have a monster. Oh, we have a treasure chest, though. If you end your turn 
in that location, you get to draw two treasure cards and keep one of them. However, we're going to have to spawn a monster, and I'm going to have to place two traps out. These traps can potentially be disabled if you're on the tile and you spend your action doing that, but I'm going to have to move on there <laughs> uh, to even go into that room. And did you notice? This room is a dead end. So that means if I go in here, I'm going to have to deal with an encounter. So first, though, let's spawn our monster. We have for our monster draw an intellect devourer. I hate these things. Okay, 15 AC, 1 health, it attacks with a 4, and it doesn't damage you, it stuns you. But if you're already stunned, it would deal you 5 damage. It has a special ability. Stun heroes are considered to be closer to this monster than other heroes on the same tile. If a stunned hero's uh, mind is devoured, the attack instead deals 5 damage. Oh, this guy's gross. The miniature for these intellect devourers is another level of miniature. Look at that, you can't even see it. It looks like a little dot. <laughs> Uh, they're pretty terrible, but that's okay. The other ones are pretty good. I think the only one that's kind of pathetic is the sword, if you ask me. I know it's hard to make a miniature for that, uh, but it is what it is. They're not my favorite. It'll still work. It's also not my favorite enemy. All right, now we have to draw an encounter card because there was a black arrow, even though we explored. We'll flip over our encounter card, and we have the Elder Rune. Looking up at the wall, you are just able to make out the shape of a strange rune before it takes effect. Draw an Elder Rune card and roll a die. On a roll of 10 or lower, resolve the card's Bane effect. On a roll of 11 or higher, resolve the card's Boon effect. Come on, 11 or higher. We have a 19. Wow, that was almost a crit. So we get to resolve the Boon effect. We'll flip over the Elder Rune card, and that's the Bane, so I get the positive one, the Boon. It says, when you take damage, take one less damage. Discard this card after using its effects. Nice! Okay, I'll take that. It's a little bit of armor for at least one attack. However, now we have to deal with this Intellect Devourer trying to eat our brains. If it's within one tile, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and devours their mind. Otherwise, the Intellect Devourer moves one tile towards the closest hero. This just makes me think of that D&D &D movie as well. I loved that movie. It was so good. <laughs> I now want to rewatch it for the, I think, fifth time. I love that movie. It's just so fun. Okay, we'll put it here. It's adding four to its die roll. The good thing is our AC is 17, so it needs to roll a 13 or higher to hit us. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, it's exactly a 13. We're stunned. There are these stunned tokens you can put around your miniature to remind yourselves that you're stunned. And that will mean our next turn we have to give up our free move. I can still do a move, but that will be my action then for the turn. Which maybe I'll just do that, deal with the trap, and go to that treasure. However, that um, stupid thing is still going to stand there. I don't know. I'll have to figure that out. But right now we're just stunned. We don't take the 5 damage unless we're attacked while we're stunned. I have an idea with Marcone. Not sure it's the smartest, but we're going to do it anyways. His movement is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. He's going to step on this trap. Hopefully it's a safe one. No, dealing us two damage. He's at half health right now. He has three damage. Oh, boy. He is, however, on the same tile as that intellect uh, devourer. It only has one health, so he's going to use his thunderclap, hoping that he can hit him. We need a 9 for this to be successful. We have a 20 that deals plus 1 damage. I think that Intellect Devourer is toast. That gives us our 4th XP. We are 1 away from being able to cancel an encounter card. Let's draw our treasure card. We have, for our treasure card, a recovery. Play immediately. Your hero regains 1 hit point. Nice. And recharges one of your used powers or items. Well, I haven't used any of those, so I lose that ability, but... Getting rid of a damage is definitely worth it. We'll discard this. We then have the option of moving two spaces after doing our attack. I have two options. I could go one, two, and we could explore here. I might get a monster. Likely I'm going to get a monster, but then I don't draw an encounter card, maybe. Or I could go one, two, and get to the treasure chest, and then I have to deal with an encounter card. You know what we're doing. Treasure chest. We're going to end our turn there. That means we get to draw two treasure cards and keep either one. Marcone is looking for treasure. So our first one is gaining 100 gold pieces. That's kind of boring. And our other one is gaining 100 gold pieces. Well, it's boring or boring. That was a stupid treasure chest. What a waste. <laughs> we'll get 100 gold pieces. That means in total we have 400 as a team. We'll draw that top encounter card. 
and we have heavy traffic. It seems like some of these traps have already been set off by previous adventures. Or how about these thugs that we're trying to take down? I still only have two. I need to find two more. If there's an environment card already in play, there isn't. This will remain in play until a new environment card is drawn. When triggering a trap token, roll a die. On a roll of 11 or higher, the trap token is discarded without triggering. Oh, that would have been nice just a turn ago if we had had that. Finally, the flying sword is going to activate. If the flying sword is within two tiles of a hero, yeah, it's standing right next to Cormac, it's going to attack his face. He needs an eight or higher to be hit. Oh, that's a seven. Seven plus eight is 15. Our AC for Cormac is 16. No damage. That was lucky. Okay, now it's Cormac's turn. For Cormac's turn, he could attack this flying sword or he could run. <laughs> and he is a cleric all by himself over here. Yeah, he's running. He's going to turn and say sayonara. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, he's moved five. Then he's going to do his action, and he's going to move over here. So that way we can explore another tile, not have to deal with an encounter card, hopefully. Uh, and remember, this doesn't activate until Marcone's turn. So hopefully we can start getting ourselves away from that. We can move to the exploration phase, and we have the ossuary. All this has a black arrow, so we're going to have to deal with an encounter anyways. And we're going to have to deal with a monster. We'll flip over our next monster card, and we have another veteran. Okay, that will be our third human. That human is placed in the ossuary right here, ready to attack Cormac. But Cormac's not done. We're going to have to deal with an encounter, and we have a strange swarm, like a bizarre cross between a mosquito and a bat. These creatures attempt to drain your blood. Attack each hero within one tile of your hero. That's everybody. It's a plus four to the die roll and weaken one. Yeah, I think it's a good time to use this. We have one of these. It says discard one monster card from your experience pile. So we'll discard this intellect devourer. Who needs that thing anyways? And then we can cancel an encounter card you have just drawn. That will mean though, this card is now flipped face down. We can't use that again. However, the veteran can activate. He is within one tile. So he's going to run forward and attack Cormac. He'll move one two right here and attack adding seven to his die roll that means he needs a nine to hit rolling up our die that's a 13 and that means Cormac has three damage he has five health remaining Atka is next she is stunned so that means we lose our regular movement I don't have any range attacks so the only thing I can do is move I go sorry Cormac I'm going to move one two three four five I'm going to get to this side so that veteran is adjacent to both of us. That means I can potentially have it attack Atka instead with that higher uh, AC value. I am adjacent to a location I can reveal uh, tiles on, so I hopefully don't have to draw an encounter card. Speaking of which, we have our next tile, and this is the Gauntlet. Traps on this now tile deal plus one damage if they deal damage. Oh my gosh, look at all those traps. <laughs> Ow. We might want to avoid going this way. I do have a treasure chest we can explore here, but I just don't know if that's worth it for all the damage we could take because in order to keep moving, we'd have to at least activate two traps. The nice part is we have a white triangle. That means we do not have any uh, encounter card and we have no monsters that we control. So that ends our turn. It's now to Marcone's turn. His total movement is six. He's going to move one, two, three, four, five, six. He's right here. He's on the same tile as that veteran. Why don't we thunderclap adding six to this die roll? Six plus 13 is 19. And that's certainly enough to take out the veteran. And that is our third one of these humans. One more and we complete this scenario. We also get to draw a treasure card. So we get 200 more gold pieces. So I'll cash this in for one of those 300s. That means as a team, we have 600 gold pieces. I'm looking to level up as fast as I can. I need 2000 to level up. So it's going to be a bit. During the exploration phase, we are at an edge. So we will reveal a tile. And this one has a black arrow and it has a monster spawning. And don't forget, we still have that flying sword that's going to come at us. We'll draw our monster card and we have a veteran leader that is human. Wow. So that means if we take out this veteran leader, the scenario is done. Oh, but he has two health. And then he has a couple different options for abilities. This is cool and not cool. Uh, okay, we'll spawn him. We'll place that veteran leader right here. 
Our encounter card then will be Whispers of Madness. The voices, they just won't be quiet. <laughs> I have that problem daily. Flip one of your items or daily powers face down. Okay, good thing we have this item, the Eyes of the Eagle. I do not want my daily power flipped down. So I'll flip this face down. We now have to activate both the Flying Sword and the Veteran Leader. The Flying Sword, if it's within two tiles of a hero, it moves adjacent and attacks with its blade. If we look here, one, two, Cormac is still standing there, ready to be attacked by that blade. This is adding eight to the die roll, so he needs an eight to hit. We'll roll up our die, that's an 18. Yeah, Cormac is down to four health remaining. Now the Veteran Leader will activate. If the Veteran Leader is adjacent to a hero, it's not. If the Veteran Leader is within one tile of a hero, it moves adjacent to the closest hero and attacks with its longsword, dealing two damage. The only good thing here is the Veteran can still stay on this tile, so he's disadvantaged for this attack thanks to Mark Hone's ability. Let's control the winds, shall we? Oh, there's a 20 and a 1. <laughs> that 20 would have dealt plus 1 damage. That would have been 3. That would have put Marcone down to 1 health, but that 1 is a miss, so no damage to Marcone. Cormac could most certainly run over to that veteran leader and attack him, but he doesn't have any treasures. And there's a treasure sitting right here. And we do have that heavy traffic. Maybe one of those traps won't go off. We have 4 health remaining. So we have a total movement of five. We're thinking of going one, two, three, and let's do this one for four. Let's see what this trap does. That deals four damage, and actually it's five because of the gauntlet. Oh, that will actually kill him unless he rolls an 11 or higher here. Serves Cormac right if you think about it. He was getting greedy. We'll roll. He's got a four. That means he takes five damage. He would normally die, but he has his Circle of Mortality. He's going to roll this die. If he rolls an 11 or higher, he'll have 1 HP remaining. He rolls a 14. He has 1 health remaining. This treasure had better be worth it. He'll take his last movement, pick up this treasure. We'll get to look at two treasure cards and choose one. He'll flip over his treasure cards. He has either gained 100 bucks or 100 coins. Or a hundred coins, that's it. He almost died for a hundred coins. <laughs> you know, all of his uh, friends here are just laughing at him. Why did he do that? During the exploration phase, we're not at an unexplored edge, so we just draw one of our encounters during the villain phase. And we have Overwhelmed. Each hero takes damage equal to the number of monsters he or she controls. Marcone is so pissed at Cormac right now. That's two damage for him. No one else controls any monsters. So just two damage to Cormac, Cormac or I should say it, to Marcone. Marcone only has two health remaining. Thanks, Cormac. It's Atka's turn. She is simply going to move one, two, three, four, get onto the same tile as that veteran axe hand. And let's take him out. I shouldn't say axe hand, veteran leader. She can use her daily power smash and slash. I'm not even going to roll because we get to attack one adjacent monster and then attack one adjacent monster. Even if we miss, we deal one damage. So if we did that twice and missed both times, we'd still deal the two damage. The veteran leader is toast and we just completed the scenario. I do think we still get our treasure though. And our treasure will be a potion of healing. Oh great, so we get to keep this potion of healing. The other potion of healing we have to discard because at the end of the scenario, we don't get to keep that one. That's cleared the bandits out, at least for now. Time to head back to the Yawning Portal and get your reward. Victory. The heroes win the adventure when they have defeated four humans in their experience pile. We have that. If the heroes complete the scenario without using any healing surges, we didn't, we each receive 200 gold pieces. That means Marcone and Atka each have 500, and Cormac has only 300. <laughs> We then are going to remove three cards, one from the treasure deck, the monster deck, and the encounter deck. A pouch of copper, a mad laughter, and a brief respite. And then we're just going to add in a bag of silver into the treasure uh, stack. The monsters and encounters, we're just going to have one less card in there. When you go to the yawning portal, the heroes collectively draw four treasure cards after each adventure. Purchase any or all item cards drawn that they can afford for the buy price listed on the card. Unpurchased items are returned to the treasure deck before the next adventure. 
We can also sell any of the items that we have found, but I think I'm going to keep the two that I have found so far. We also have advancements. Any of the six Yawning Portal advancement tokens may be purchased for the cost listed on the token. Each hero may not have more than more advancements than their level. So since we're all level one, we can have at most one advancement. We can also level up for 2,000 gold pieces. If we lumped everything together, we have 1,300, so no level ups yet. Bummer. Here are the three cards we're going to remove from the campaign. That Mad Laughter we actually drew, a Brief Respite, I think we drew that one too, and we drew tons of pouches of copper. We now have a pouch of silver, which will give us 200 gold pieces. I'm going to throw that into the stack of treasure cards. Here we have the six different advancements. From how I understand this, once you buy one of those, you have it for the campaign, which is really nice. So I'm actually thinking of having Marcone, who only has six health, to get this regain two HP. So I'm going to have him use 500 of his money. And then because Cormac was the selfish one trying to steal extra money, <laughs> he's going to give up one of his uh, 300. So he'll get 200 remaining back. And we're going to buy that regen to HP. That will specifically be for uh, Marcone. I drew the top four cards of the treasure deck. Two of them were items, but unfortunately, neither of these we can even buy. We only have 700 coins left. This costs 1,600, and this costs 1,000. Uh, do we want to get rid of the Eye of the Eagle? I don't think so. I think this is pretty dang great, and we'd only get 600 gold pieces for that. So Marcone is going to hold on to that. We're not going to buy anything else. That's all we're going to do uh, at the Yawning Portal. This will complete Adventure 1 of the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I really enjoyed this. I love how the rules are relatively simple. You do have some tactical choices, lots of fun and variety of different monsters and all the different powers you have. So I am super excited to play this again. I want to give a big shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you so much for supporting us. It's because of you that Barrett and I do what we do. And thank you subscribers as well. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, make sure to subscribe and like and do all that jazz. We'd appreciate it. And if you're excited to see what Barrent and I have coming next, then I need you to meet me at the table. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.